Great. Well, good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for um, spending part of your your day with me to discuss something that that uh, a topic that I'm I'm very interested in. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm the executive science officer for the International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. My involvement in the ILSI Gut Microbiome Committee is under the auspices of ISAP. But by the way of full disclosure, I also have a consulting business with different probiotic companies in the US and abroad in the area of probiotic microbiology and claim substantiation. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on this topic of definitions of probiotics and prebiotics. But we've also expanded this coverage a bit to some emerging definitions in the, in the microbiota intervention space. Um, this topic is very important to me um, as reflected in my co-authorship of two consensus papers that were published in Nature Review, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, um, working with the ISAP group. One was on probiotics and one was on prebiotics, and I will speak to those in just a second. Um, but I wanted to start my talk today with a short discussion on why we should care about definitions. Why do they matter? And I just want it to be clear that stakeholders need a common language. We need agreed upon definitions that enable us to be precise when we are discussing an issue. And the different stakeholders in this space are gonna be scientists, industry, consumers, as well as regulators. Consumers need to be clear what probiotic and prebiotic mean on a label. I think regulators need to be clear what substances they are regulating and therefore what type of regulations make sense for them. And I think without clear definitions, we don't have any path to global harmonization. Scientists certainly should be consistent with word usage in publications to avoid confusion. And finally, I think industry benefits if we have a common language and agreed upon definitions. I think overall the impression of the field is higher quality if all the stakeholders can agree. And I think adherence to definitions avoids the appearance of fraud. There are a variety of probiotic, or I'm sorry, there are a variety of products on the market today that, that claim to be probiotic. Maybe some are, maybe some aren't, but I think that there's certainly room in the marketplace for better adherence to these definitions. Um, I just wanted to point out a blog that I recently posted on the usprobiotics.org website, which, which I manage the content on that, specifically pointing out an example of misuse of the term probiotic. This was a case with a Cooking Light article um, in an issue with your complete guide to, to gut health. Maybe some of you saw that. Um, the author of one of the articles in that issue insisted that sourdough bread was the, the number one probiotic fermented food. And when a colleague of mine pointed out to her that sourdough bread is not a probiotic food because it doesn't contain any live microorganisms, she said that she had read an article that dead microbes had benefits. And so she dug her heels in and said that she was not going to make any change to it. So I think that we have examples like this that need to be called out. And hopefully we can do a better job of getting these definitions out so people don't misinform consumers and, and their readers about things like this. So let's talk first about the definition of probiotics. So probiotics have been defined by a consensus panel that ISAP convened in 2013 as live microorganisms that, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. And this definition is simply a grammatical improvement over the definition that was published in a 2001 um, expert um, it wasn't a consensus panel, it was an expert consultation that was convened by the FAOWHO in Argentina. Um, and this particular definition is published in Nature Review and Gastroenter Gastroenterology and Hepatology, as I mentioned, and it's one of their top downloaded articles um, of all times in that journal. Now let's talk a little bit about this definition. Um, the value of this definition, in my opinion, is that it is clear, it's actionable and it is inclusive. And by that, I mean it is not unduly restrictive in terms of what can be considered a probiotic. And I will go into that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. I will point out that this definition does not specify safety for the intended use, but I think that it is implied by the requirement that, that these substances have to have a health benefit. So any health benefit can't be negated by a product that isn't safe for its intended use. Uh, 
So let's look at some of the characteristics of historic probiotic definitions and, and look to see how this current um, ISAP definition that is really the update of the FAO definition um, compares. So with regard to mechanism, I think if you look at the historical probiotic definitions, what you'll see are comments that the mechanisms need to need to be, for example, altering the microflora, improving microbial balance, involve implantation or colonization. But this consensus definition does not stipulate anything about mechanism. The type of benefit was sometimes stipulated historically. In, um, examples are improving the properties of the indigenous microflora, modulating mucosal and systemic immunity, improving nutritional microbial balance in the intestinal tract. And again, we don't, in the ISAP definition, stipulate what type of benefit this probiotics have to um, provide. In terms of re the requirement to show a health benefit, some of the historical definitions don't require that, but of course this definition does. In terms of regulatory category, there were a few definitions historically that focused on probiotic foods. In this particular definition, the category is not stipulated. Um, in terms of the site of action, some definitions focused on the gut. This definition doesn't stipulate that. In terms of means of application, some definitions required oral, oral consumption. It's not stipulated in this definition. Live microbes um, were required by most historical definitions, so that's definitely one commonality. And of course, it is required, and that, that requirement is sustained in the um, consensus definition. In terms of GMOs, can they be probiotics? The historical definitions are, are um, silent on that. The ISAP um, consensus definition is silent on that, but there is nothing that would preclude them from being considered a probiotic if the other characteristics are met. Do they need to be defined organisms? It's not um, stipulated in historical definitions, but it certainly is implied by this definition. And finally, in terms of host, in past definitions, it was it was um, stipulated that it was humans consuming them in, in some past definitions. In the ISAP consensus definition, it's not stipulated. And so what I would like to point out is that not stipulating many of these parameters really allows for innovation and does not provide... Um, uh, it, it, it is not needlessly prescriptive in terms of issues that, that, that the, the experts didn't feel needed to pr be prescriptive on. And further, it does not rely on unvalidated characterizations. And I will just say when you look at some regulatory um, requirements that are in the probiotic space, some of them want to require that you do, you demonstrate in vivo adherence or that you in, you demonstrate colonization or um, traits such as that, that really are very difficult to, to prove there, there are not validated tests to determine them. And oftentimes they don't even, um, they, it, you can't even show that those, those traits are, are present in some probiotic strains. And finally, they probably aren't traits that are necessary for in vivo functionality. So we've tried to just push all of that aside and, and, re and really focused on the key requirements of a probiotic. So if you look at the minimum criteria for a commercial probiotic, and in this case, I'm limiting that to human use, um, what and and this is these are a list of bullet points or this is a list of bullet points that came out of a 2018 ISAP meeting discussion group on global harmonization, and basically the list included identification to the strain level, naming um, the probiotic according to valid nomenclature. It has to be safe for the intended use. The product needs to provide sufficient levels of live microbes until the end of shelf life to deliver the stated health benefit. The product needs to be accurately labeled. You have to provide evidence of a health benefit from a human study. And finally, you need to deposit that in an international culture collection. So this um, table comes out of a paper, uh, a fairly old paper that, that I wrote back in 2009, and I'm happy to send um, a, a reprint of this if anyone is interested. Um, and all I want to point out is, is some issues about what a probiotic isn't. So if you look at the bottom of this table, um, we've already talked about what a probiotic is. And, and I just want to point out that probiotics are not synonymous with native putatively beneficial microbes. And you see this mistake all the time in the literature where someone um, and, and oftentimes the lay literature where, where an author refers to a person's native probiotics. So that's an improper use of the term. Um, and it's not synonymous with live active cultures. 
some live active cultures are probiotics, but not all. It is not, and that's primarily because oftentimes live active cultures haven't been tested for specific health benefits. And certainly live vaccines or undefined fecal enemas would not be considered probiotics either. And so in short, there are two basic ways not to be a probiotic. You either don't, the strains involved don't meet the definition or the strain may be that you put in your product does meet the the definition, but you don't aren't true to your label claim, so you aren't delivering an adequate dose. And both of those ways are, are means of not being a probiotic. So if we look at what's encompassed under the term, this is a figure out of um, a cur current opinions in biotechnology paper that was recently published. And just very briefly, what we have under the probiotic definition is animal feed and drugs, human drugs, and foods that have tested defined live microbes. And under the food category, we have conventional foods, dietary supplements, and medical foods that all could be under there. So this really refers back to the different regulatory categories that a probiotic might be. But not a probiotic or fermented foods with undefined and untested microbiota or undefined microbial consortia that might, for example, be used for fecal microbial transplants. And also under this, obviously, dead microbes, microbial end products, microbial components, and undefined microbial mixes also are not probiotics. Now, what we're seeing often is the, the term probiotic used on a wide range of products. And those products range from lawn products, mattresses, cleaners, air sprays, cosmetics, a huge array of foods, as well as others. And the image I have on the right side of this slide was one that just showed up on my doorstep one day. And this particular advertisement was for a lawn product that they claimed was probiotic and, of course, 93% natural which there's lots of questions that that makes you think about. But I think as these new products come on that are using this product, using this, um, the term probiotic, or I should possibly say misusing the term probiotic, we need as a, as a, industry or as a as a group to to be very clear about which of these are meeting the definition and which are not. And I think one of the big issues with regard to many of these types of products is how do you define confer a health benefit? And even in the cosmetic area, which is getting to be a very popular area for pro probiotics, right now, um, I think what we have is, is a, a potential problem of determining whether or not a cosmetic that results in some type of a cosmetic or beautification claim could really be considered a health benefit. And is that the proper use of the, of the term? Now, I wanted to very briefly go over uh, or, or touch base about the issue about establishing health benefits for probiotics. And there are many challenges of doing this. And I think one of them is, is how many studies are needed um, and what type of study design would be required to be convincing for that evidence. Other issues are there's few recognized biomarkers for many probiotic endpoints, um, especially in the gut health area. We have mixed results for some of the studies that have been published um, on probiotics. We have some positive and I should say some null studies. Um, and those, but I think it's very important to remember that when you um, take on the, the challenge of conducting a clinical trial or a human intervention trial, you are always running the risk that that trial ends up being null. And that could possibly be because it's underpowered, um, you've underestimated the magnitude of your effect, or it might be that, that there were confounders that you didn't really account for. Those are the reality when you conduct clinical um, interventions. And I think that the important thing to remember is you have to look at the totality of results. One null trial does not negate the ability to demonstrate that that same product, in fact, does have effects. You need to look at the totality of the evidence. In this space, the magnitude of effects may be small. Sometimes they're not small, but sometimes they might be. That's very appropriate for uh, food products if, if they're being delivered in that way. And so I don't consider that a problem, but it makes it difficult to, to um, find those effects if the effects are small. There are oftentimes numerous confounders, including background diet, baseline microbiota, placebo effect rates um, that can make these studies difficult to do. Choice of placebo, especially if you're doing a food study, can be a challenge. 
choosing study populations. Of course, we're very interested right now in demonstrating effects in healthy people, but those are difficult to establish. And as soon as you choose a patient population, you could potentially trigger the drug status for um, any type of claim that you wanted to make for your product. And I think we are in a situation today that we oftentimes don't understand the criteria in terms of who we would expect to respond and who we would expect not to respond to any given probiotic intervention. And for that reason, it's difficult to, um, it, well, for that reason, you would ne typically need to include a much um, greater number of subjects because you're going to have to be um, accounting for non-responders in that group as well. I think in our field, dose response studies are rare, but they can be convincing. And so I think that they're good to do. I also wanted to point out um, an important point for especially today because fermented foods are really quite the rage today. But as I mentioned earlier, fermented foods are not synonymous with probiotics. And I think it's important for us to recognize how they differ. So to recap, probiotics must contain live microbes, they must be tested and shown to have a health benefit, and they must deliver a level of live microbes that are shown to confer that health benefit. Fermented foods are made by live, live microbes, but live microbes might not survive into the food um, that is consumed, and that's due to post-fermentation processing. A fermented food may not have been tested for health benefits beyond basic nutritional value, and so although they're, fermented foods are likely healthy dietary um, components, they may not meet the bar to be called a probiotic. But of course, there are some fermented foods that are probiotic foods, and in that case, they must meet all of the, def the criteria of a probiotic. They must contain live microbes. They must be tested and shown to have a health benefit. And there are a few um, more refined ways of considering probiotic fermented foods. So for example, the health benefit must result at least in part from the live microbes present or from the probiotic it is there. The health benefit must go beyond meeting basic micro and macronutrient nutritional needs. And so you can't just say that, well, a probiotic food or this food has live microbes, this food is nutritious and therefore it's a probiotic food. That really doesn't meet the criteria. And it must deliver a level of live microbes that are shown to have um, a health benefit. So let's move on to prebiotics now. Um, prebiotics were defined by a second consensus panel convened by ISAP as subst a substrate that is selectively utilized by host microorganisms conferring a health benefit. And this paper was also published in Nature Review, Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And um, the lead author is Glenn Gibson, um, for, and it was published last year. There have been a variety of definitions that have been published for prebiotics, they're summarized in this table that was um, put, that was included in a paper that was authored by Bindles in a 2015 publication. Um, what I will point out is that Glenn Gibson and, and Marcel Robefroy were, Freud were the first to, um, to define prebiotics, and it has been redefined by both of them <laughs> subsequently in a variety of ways. Um, but I'm not going into all of these definitions right now, but what I will do is just a quick compare and contrast between previous definitions and the ISAP consensus definition. So unlike probiotics, for prebiotics, the mechanism is absolutely stipulated. So a prebiotic must function by selective utilization by host microbes. Um, it, it, but previous definitions would talk about selective stimulation, selective fermentation. They would specifically re refer to the impact on composition or activity of the GI microflora. And it would also sometimes stipulate what beneficial microbes needed to respond, um, primarily bifidobacteria, to, to prebiotics. But the ISAP consensus definition is, is more focused than that. In terms of the nature of substances, previous definitions were limited to ingredients or food ingredients. Um, in the ISAP definition, it's not um, stipulated, and so the opportunity to, to prepare these or to utilize these in feeds in, um, as well as in drug type applications is, is open under this definition. And of course, the regulatory category um, fits under that as well. In terms of the site of action, um, previous definitions specified the colon or the GI tract, but the um, consensus definition does not stipulate that. So you could potentially envision a prebiotic meeting this consensus definition, but being used to have an impact on other um, host 
back, uh, microbiological communities in other sites other than the GI tract. In terms of means of application, previous definitions um, stated oral consumption. Um, this definition doesn't stipulate it. In terms of the host, um, previous definitions would specify humans or not stipulate one. This definition doesn't stipulate it. But all the definitions do require a health benefit. So again, the prebiotic definition that, that was put forward by the ISAP consensus panel um, is a bit less um, prescriptive than some of the other definitions um, that have been offered historically. Now let's again look at minimum criteria for prebiotics for human use. Uh, again, this came out of the, the discussion panel or the discussion group that was held at the ISAP 2018 meeting last month. And this includes adequate chemical characterization, naming according to valid chemical nomenclature, has to be safe for intended use, it has to be selectively utilized by host microbes, it has to be, there has to be a sufficient amount until the end of shelf to deliver a health benefit, oops, excuse me, but not so much to deliver symptoms. Um, health evidence of a health benefit from a human study has to be provided, and the benefit must be mediated by a positive impact on the microbiota. And finally, the, another stipulation is, is that the microbes that utilize the prebiotic should be identified and evidence of selective utilization should be provided. Now, briefly, what's a symbiotic? Um, this definition was, was offered back in 1995. Um, essentially, it's a mixture of probiotics and prebiotics. I think there's a need for a consensus definition on symbiotics, and I'm hoping that ISAP will do that one as well. But what I would like to point out about symbiotics is that even though they are a combination of pro and prebiotics that, that essentially can provide a health benefit through interaction with the, 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 micro, the host microbiota, um, this slide is from Glenn Gibson, and I think it's a really important concept to recognize. And that is, is that some prebiotics may be what we call complementary symbiotics, and some may be what we call synergistic symbiotics. Now, a complementary symbiotic is essentially the addition of a prebiotic to a probiotic, both of which, once they're um, util being utilized by the host microbial community, have their independent benefits, but the effects may be additive. A synergistic symbiotic, however, is a, a, a symbiotic that is designed so that the prebiotic that's been chosen will stimulate the growth or activity of the specific probiotic that it's paired with. And, and that type of very intelligent design of, of matching these two components is something that I think has great potential, but I'm not aware of any commercial prebiotics that, that meet this definition quite yet, but I'm sure that these are being developed. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about emerging terms in the microbiota space. Uh, we've mentioned pre, pro, and symbiotics, but you will start seeing or have seen many other types of terms in this field. Abiotic, postbiotic, pharmabiotic, immunobiotic, psychobiotic, probiotic, probioceutical, as well as live biotherapeutic agents. Now, live biotherapeutic agents has been clearly defined by the Food and Drug Administration, um, which basically is a probiotic drug for the most part. But the other terms have been published, have been defined in different ways <clears throat> in different publications. And there certainly is a need um, if these terms are going to be used um, to have them defined clearly for the, the scientific community as well as others. Now, Marie asked me to, um, while discussing um, about probiotics to talk about some impending taxonomy changes for the lactobacillus genus. And these are certainly going to be important in the probiotic space going forward. So you may or may not be aware of this, but the, the taxonomy of the lactobacillus genus is abnormally heterogeneous. And the scientists all agree on this. Um, and, and to characterize this heterogeneity, currently there are 231 lactobacillus species. They range from a genome size of 1.2 to 4.9 megabases. They have GC contents of 32 to 57 percent, and an average, average nucleotide identity that is more typical for a family or even a higher taxonomic order. 
And in short, what the what the taxonomists say are that these ranges that are present in the current Lactobacillus genus are far beyond what is, what is acceptable for a bacterial genus. And so these experts are now recommending that the current current genus should be split into 12 new genera. Now the genus of some well-known Lactobacillus species would then be renamed. So some of these would be Ruteri and Rhamnosus, Casei, Paracasei, Plantarum would all end up with new genus names. So they would no longer be Lactobacillus ruteri, for example. The Acidophilus group, however, um, Lactobacillus acidophilus would remain a Lactobacillus. Now these types of changes are sure to have important repercussions um, commercially as well as scientifically. Now, to understand the process, nomenclature changes are formally proposed by the taxonomist doing the, the research that justifies these changes in the International Journal of Systematic and Evolutionary Microbiology. The authors are the ones who will decide on the names. And this particular publication is the official journal of record for the development of novel, novel prokaryotic taxa and the official publication of, of important organizations as well in this space. Now, there is going to be a LAB industrial platform expert workshop that is going to be convened um, in October of this year. The LABIP is a platform focused on um, companies involved in EU-sponsored research programs. And this is an association that was founded back in 1994 and is com and comprises companies that produce or use lactic acid bacteria or have and have production or research facilities within the EU. Now this workshop um, is titled Major Changes in the Taxonomy of Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus, Consequences for Industry. This workshop is going to be held, as I mentioned, in October in Verona, Italy. There are 34 people um, that are invited to attend. It is a closed workshop, so you can't register for this. But the people attending are academics, EFSA um, representatives, and industry members. Um, and the industry representatives are all members of the LABIP. The program focuses on the science and the consequences for probiotic safety legal issues such as IP, as well as industry issues. Now, I am going to be attending on behalf of ISAP, and I am happy to discuss with any of you issues or concerns or, or suggestions that you might have to try to make this transition as painless as possible. So one thing that I was asked to do was to, to make um, a statement with regard to how ISAP intends to respond to these nomenclature changes. Um, we haven't fully de determined this as yet because it is a fairly new development, but I think it's safe to say that we will embrace the changes. I, I don't think there's any stopping it. So whatever that we have to be true to the science and, and embrace the, the nomenclature changes. ISAP, I would anticipate, would advocate for assuring that new names are not objectionable from a marketing point of view. Um, one approach could be to make sure that the species names are retained. Another approach might be that new gene, um, genera that are identified or the names that come up with them begin with the letter L. So at a minimum, you could still speak of lactobacillus, or I'm sorry, you could still speak of L ruteri, even if you can't say lactobacillus ruteri. Um, and maybe there's some opportunity for, for new genus names to be some variation of lactobacillus, but I don't know exactly what that would look like. Um, ISAP would advocate for a transition period for commercial products to comply with, with these changes. Um, but of course, we would be true to the FAO WHO guidelines that say that you need to name your product according to current nomenclature. Well, ISAP also intends to develop clear communications to consumers, healthcare providers, and regulatory organizations to try to very clearly make the point that my, the microbes here have not been changed, but the names are different. We would be more than happy to collaborate with any stakeholders that might be interested in being um, working with us to develop any of these materials. We, we think this is a very important undertaking and um, the, I think the more people involved, the more stakeholders involved, the, the better the materials would be. And we certainly have an open mind as to what kind of formats and means of dissemination um, we would have. So we could do webinars, we could make infographics, we could do videos and blogs, um, we could do TV spots. I mean, we, I don't know what the best um, opportunities are. I do think probably our biggest challenge, though, as an organization is the dissemination. 
So we've got the right people to develop the content. I don't think we have the right systems in place to do a good job with dissemination. And with that in mind, I think it would be great to collaborate with, with companies that are interested in getting the messages out and utilize the expertise that, that, that they have to um, disseminate this information. And I think it's going to be important to get out in front of it before negative or incorrect information um, gets out so that we're not having to do um, mop up. I was also asked uh, to provide a little bit of background on ISAP's perspective on the IPA codex proposal. As all of you are, I'm sure, are aware, the International Probiotics Association in December proposed with the Codex Alimentarius a, um, a well, they developed a proposal to more clearly define the required characteristics of safe and efficacious probiotics and to ensure the same level of quality and manufacturing requirements for all operators on the global market. So the overall justification or the overall goal here is to have all the global players in the commercial probiotic market to be on even footing with regard to what they say and how they can, can determine that their product meets the probiotic requirements. And I think that this is being justified based on the global occurrence of products that are sold being called probiotics that don't really meet the accepted definition. And from an ISAP point of view, I think overall, we feel that global harmonization is likely good for the field. I think carrying this forward, if I understand the process correctly, really will be in Argentina's hands because they're the country that agreed to bring this forward and in, into the codex um, purview. I think we need to be very aware of potential unintended negative consequences from this. Um, that might stem from a possible lack of consensus because nobody has any control of ultimately what Argentina will ultimately propose. So I think that there just needs to be a bit of caution. I think that the proposal, if you read all the way through it, it, it presents some real challenges in some sections because it, uh, it intends to address these five issues, the definition of probiotic, what criteria are needed, safety manufacturing and efficacy. I think the definition and criteria are reasonably straightforward, but I think there are some serious challenges with coming up with the criteria for safety manufacturing and efficacy. So I'd just like to make a few points. I think in terms of safety, I think we need to build off of what we already know and not try to pretend that there isn't a baseline of information for traditional probiotics and their safety profiles. So I think we can easily advocate for adopting the QPS approach that's used in Europe for probi probiotic strains. And I think that we need to think very carefully before requiring any animal testing or phase one safety tests for QPS strains um, that very likely might not be needed for um, establishing safety. I think with regard to manufacturing, good manufacturing practices are likely fairly straightforward, uh, but I do think um, there are some questions in terms of, of product labeling and um, uh, that I think need to be considered. So for example, how is the best way to handle product labeling of multi-strain products? I think if you uh, currently, we just oftentimes will see a total count on supplements as well as um, fermented foods or probiotic foods, I should say. And that's been the way the industry has been for a long time. Is that adequate? And should we start trying to think about ways to actually individually provide counts for each of the strains presented in a product in the same manner, for example, a multivitamin would give you concentrations of every vitamin that's present. I think another issue that's emerging is the one of dead microbes. Um, and, and as you know, especially in the supplement area, dead microbes um, certainly are added in order for a very reasonable um, or for a very important reason. And that's because uh, manufacturers want to assure I'm sorry, did I say dead microbes are added for a reason? I meant overages are added for a reason. And that is because they need to assure that the product stays viable at the a labeled count through the end of shelf life. What that means, of course, is that if you have an overage that is even as high, let's say, as, as a tenfold increase or higher number than what's on the product, that means that 90% of the microbes at the end of shelf life may actually be dead microbes. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just wondering if there is some consideration that needs to be given as to whether or not those dead microbes constitute a functional ingredient. Because as I mentioned earlier, there is evidence that's accumulating that, that dead microbes may have functionality as well.
And I think the hardest issue is the one of efficacy, because I don't think there's consensus for what bar is the appropriate bar for establishing any health benefit claims. Do you go with the highest possible standard, which is the standard that seems to be being applied in Europe? Do you go with competent and reliable scientific evidence? Do you go with qualified, the allowance to have qualified claims or evidence that can be qualified and still lead to saying that there's some evidence, even though it might not be the highest level evidence. And I think that that's going to be a tough, a tough issue to, to address in this codex proposal. And I think another really important point that we don't have consensus on is when do human studies need to be repeated to confirm that changes in manufacturing or changes in the product haven't impacted efficacy. And that's going to be a difficult one to deal with as well. So I'm a bit over on my time now. So let me just conclude um, I, in, that I think there are clear, actionable, and inclusive definitions um, which allow for innovation that exists for probiotics and prebiotics. New terms needing consensus definitions are emerging. The lactobacillus genus taxonomy is going to change and it's probably gonna change soon. People are estimating maybe by December, the paper will be published and companies are going to need to know how to react and how to comply with these changes. And finally, um, an avenue for global harmonization of probiotic definition and standards um, has been proposed by IPA um, through the codex venue. So I will stop there and, and entertain any questions. Thank you.